so thankful for you. Amen. Amazing, amazing people. And this whole church tonight full of amazing people. We're glad you're here. We're so glad to have our general secretary of the United Pentecostal Church. S Scott Graham is a name on every preacher's tongue. Has impacted their life with his ministry. Young people. Everyone that's ever heard his preaching would walk away saying my life has been changed. Today I've wept most of the afternoon because of the word today. And I'm thankful that God loves his sheep. Even that are wounded. Amen. This pastor loves you too. Come on. I love this church. I love you people. Amen. There's nothing like God's people. You know that? There's nothing like it. And uh, he's been a, a constant voice, a safe voice, a consistent voice. His preaching has impacted my life. And I know my wife's and my own children I've seen even impacted again today. We're so glad that you are here. Thank you for taking time to be in Zanesville. Would you give him a big anchor welcome? We're so glad that he's here. Oh, I love being saved. If you're not enjoying being saved, man, you ought to get saved tonight. This is wonderful. and It's such a joy to be with you. I give honor to all the folks who've gathered tonight. And my understanding is that many of you have come from Daughter Works and Satellite campuses. And I just thank you for being here this evening. It's honored by your presence. And uh, certainly give honor to Cottrell and to... Brother Bounds, it is really kind. You, you don't know what a Christian this man is. It's the first time, he reminded me today, the first time I ever laid eyes on him. I was preaching for his dad, and he came walking in. He had the same barber then that he has now. And I didn't know him. I can't believe I did this. I'm ashamed of myself, but it speaks to your character. He walked in the room. And they introduced me, and I said, man, that's great. How's your chemo going? That's the first thing I said to that man because of, you know, I just, that's terrible. That's, that's horrible. God help me. Pray for my wife. She lives with that. I'd almost forgotten that. Your brother told me about it. It's good to see you, and I thank God he's shared with me the wonderful reports of what God's doing in your church, and I celebrate and rejoice with you tonight. Amen. <laughs> Zanesville, I assume at some level you probably know it, but perhaps because you're here, you don't have the same frame of reference I have. But your pastor, his preaching, is honored, revered, and loved, and, and just valued all across the fellowship of the United Pentecostal Church every place you go people travel to come hear this man preach so I do hope you understand what a blessing you have every week to hear the word of the Lord from his lips so I know what kind of buffet comes over this pulpit regularly I just feel like a bologna sandwich or something up here tonight but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm honored love pastor and sister Bounds very special and their kiddos Enjoyed spending time with them today. Exodus chapter 20. Let me direct you to the word of the Lord tonight. Exodus chapter 20 and verse number one. And this is a, a significantly more familiar pastor scripture than the one I read this morning. Uh, Exodus chapter 20 and verse number one. In fact, if you're up on your Bible trivia, as soon as I said Exodus 20, you know what I'm about to read. Exodus 20 and verse one. And God spake all these words saying... I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Aren't you glad for that? Now he says, as a result of that, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I'm really glad the Bible doesn't stop right there. Because that next verse, and showing mercy, oh, well, thank God, unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God in it. Thou shalt not do any work, thou or thy son or thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is in thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And because you're intelligent people, you understand that what I just read to you, we commonly call Ten Commandments. My message title tonight is a little unique. And if you have tried to persuade your fellow worshipers that you were never out in the beggarly elements of sin, if you have tried to convince them that you know nothing about the seem unseemly life in perhaps a pool hall, please don't react to my title because I'm not in the pool hall tonight. But my title is this. They can put the slide up. Number 10 in the corner. I'm not playing billiards. Preach tonight on the subject number 10 in the corner. Now you're really curious. What's he going to do with that? Well, good. You'll stick around. That's wonderful. You can be seated. God bless you tonight. I want to start with a very simple declaration that mercy, I hope you believe this because it'll save me some time and energy. But here's what I know. There is nothing like the church. Friend, I want to tell you, I love the church. This crazy year of pandemic of being separated, I've heard guys say, you know, it's going to convince some people they don't need the church. Maybe it will. I'll tell you what it convinced me. I love being in church. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. Paul called it a mystery which had been hidden from the ages past but was revealed in the New Testament age. It is such a wonder that the Bible uses various descriptive metaphors and similes to try to help us grasp its profound nature. There is the marvel of Christ having a bride which is identified as the church of Jesus Christ. Collectively, we are betrothed to him and we anxiously await the moment when we'll sit down with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Not only is it a bride, it's called a building crafted by God and founded upon the message of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone and all of us are lively stones fitted together, the Bible says, to build up a habitation for the Lord. It's a building. Oh, not this building, but the building that is crafted by all of us as stones in the wall to pride collectively a habitation for his spirit. It's a bride, it's a building, it's a family in which we are brothers and sisters and God is our father. And there is a familial care and unity which arises from this relationship wherein we might even disagree from time to time, but underneath it all we keep this straight. We've got the same name and we've got the same blood and we've got the same father and the church is our mother and we are family. It's a bride. It's a building. It's a family. It's a body with Christ as the head. And each of us as members in particular. No two alike, but no one unneeded. All interconnected and valuable. Hear me right now. Until a disparate group of people with different backgrounds and different educations and different incomes and different perspectives and different skin colors and different political philosophies can lay all that stuff aside at the door of the church and said that stuff may divide us out there, but it can't not divide us in here we are a body is anybody besides me sick of our culture trying to pit this group against that group and this set against that set and we're against you and you're against them I want to tell you in the house of God that stuff does not, not exist we're not against each other we're for the king of kings we're in this thing together, folks. A pastor.
pastored for a few years in a place called Florissant, Missouri. Probably hardly any of you ever heard of that. But I'm six miles from a place you have heard of, Ferguson, Missouri. Oh, yeah, that one. Six miles from where people were trying to tear each other apart. Now, I would tell you the media didn't depict it quite like it was. I don't mean the incident that led to it, and I'm not here to discuss policing practices or Michael Brown or that tragedy that occurred, because I don't care what you think about what went down, a mama buried her boy. And that's a tragedy no matter what led up to it. Okay, and in all of our political leanings, we better be careful to forget there's a personal side to all these stories, and we're supposed to win those people, not alienate them. But I'm six miles away from the focal point of the United States of America as buildings burn and rocks were thrown and all kinds of violence was ensuing. And every educated idiot was telling us that we can't get along. You know, there's just deep divides and there's racial this and income that. And, you know, it's just the way it is. We can't get along. I wish they could have walked into my church on Sunday. I wish they could have been on there on Sunday when people of different colors and different backgrounds walked in and hugged on one another and said, all oh, that junk is out there, but it's not it. And I charge you in the Holy Ghost, don't bring that garbage in here. We are one body. We are one body and we love everybody. And his church has every kindred, every tribe, every nation, and every town. Let me say in English, God doesn't have a white church and a black church and a Hispanic church and an Asian church. God has a church and, e and everybody, whosoever will, is welcome in his church. We're a body. We walked in that church while all kinds of chaos was going on outside. And we grabbed hold of one another and said, you're my brother and we're a family. And that junk isn't coming in here because there's nothing like his church. I'm off my notes. That's a dangerous place. But honey, we're not going to find our answer in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I may have my opinion about the election just like you do, but my salvation is not found in a political party. My salvation is in the name of the Lord. I'm not looking for government to solve it. Government can't solve it. Our world, our world does not have sociological problems. Our world has a sin problem. And the government can't solve a sin problem. You can't pass a law that fixes sin. But the church has the answer for the sin problem. That's why I say there's nothing like the church. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. We do it every week. We rejoice with those that rejoice and we weep with those that weep. And when one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And when one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. And that's what lets a group of people like this that have all kinds of differences walk in and hold on to one another and weep over a loss and then celebrate over a victory. It is that mystery that brings us together tonight. There is nothing like the church. nothing I, I just i'm not loose quite yet this isn't just a social club that you joined up in this isn't like the rotary or the ymca no 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 there's nothing there's nothing like this anywhere in the world there's nothing like the church this is where you'll find love this is where second chances are common things this is where you'll be embraced and forgiven and supported and cared for this is where you can come after a weary week of fighting hell and somebody will slip an arm around your shoulder and say i've been praying for you all week i love you you're gonna make it this 
is where we bask in the warmth of collective worship. And this is where we find healing for our minds and our hearts. This is where you bring your mistakes and find mercy. This is where you bring your disappointments and find hope. This is where you bring your weariness and find strength. I love the church. I want to be kind, but I'm sorry, but some of you just reacted as though I said, I love apple pie. (laughs) Me too. Let me try this again. I love the church. You hear me right now? For whatever flaws it might have, and I know it's got some warts, but it's still the prettiest girl at the party. See, here's here's the thing. You can be seated. I I told them young men in the office before service, don't talk bad about my mama. My mom may be watching tonight. Hi, mom. My mom is 88 years old. You said, you just gave her age out over the internet. Hey, she told me a while back, there comes a point, you're proud of it. She said, you go through a season when you're embarrassed. After a while, it sounds like an accomplishment, you know? That's what she told me. Hi, Mom. Don't cut me out of the will. My mom's 88 years old. Could probably whip most of us. Hi, Mom. I told her the other day, she called her a tough old German. She said, don't call me old. I said, yes, ma'am. Is my mom a perfect... No. Hi, Mom. But don't you go point out her faults. I'm a lovable sort of guy, but you come up and start talking bad about my mom, we go around and around. That's the one that birthed me. That's the one that loved me. That's the one that patched up my wounds. That's the one that cared for me. You don't want to come up to me and start talking bad about my mama, or we're going to discuss this. Hey, this church gave birth to me. This church loved me when nobody else did. This church bandaged my skin knees when I fell. I know it's got problems, but don't come telling me about its problems. I love the church say well brother Graham you don't you don't know our church you know it's got a problem yeah I know you're here I understand it ain't perfect you find a perfect church don't go they worked hard to get it that way we built our new church building we doubled our square footage we had twice as much room as we'd had. It was such a wonderful thing. Our upstairs hallways, this big old long hall. It's got all these Sunday school classes outside of it. Your, your pastor much better than pastor than I am. I'm sure I could never remember all those classes in order. Beginner and kindergarten and junior. And I didn't know what order they came in. I just, I'd somehow I'll tell you where to go. I don't know. I, just, I could never remember all those things. All I know is big old line up there. You know, beginner and primary and junior and junior high. And, I don't know. There's a mess of them. We had classrooms up there for discipleship and deaf ministry and all that stuff. I went to my bishop one time. I said, Bishop, we built this thing. and I wish we had one more classroom. He said, what did we leave out? I said, we need one more. He said, why? What do we need? I said, I want one more classroom with a sign outside that says negative people. (laughs) With a door that locks from the outside. And I'll put all those people in there that want to cry and complain and moan and talk about what's wrong and how bad it is. And we'll just lock the door and let them complain till Jesus comes and probably for seven years thereafter. But there's some of us that said, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. There's some of us that say, this is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. There's some of us that say, I love my church more than any other blessing in my life. I love my pastor. I love my pastor's wife. I love my fellow worshipers. I love the church. You can't run me off from the church. You can't treat me bad enough to make me leave. You know why? I need the church. 
My family needs the church. My marriage needs the church. My kids need the church. My finances need the church. I'm not going to make it to heaven without the church. Because if I want to go up in the rapture of the church, I'm probably going to have to be in the church. I depend on the church. And so between here and there, we depend on the church. Let me say it different. Between here and there, between tonight and the rapture, I depend on you. I trust the Lord. I do too. And I trust that God gave me somebody to lean on, you. And whether you like it or not, you need me. When I stand, I understand it is absolutely true that at the end of this road, I must have worked out my own salvation with fear and trembling. I got that. But it is also true. I know when I stand before God, trembling face to face in his radiant glory, I will stand there for myself and all my excuses are going to dry up in my mouth in that moment. So I'm ultimately responsible for my eternity. But it is also true that no one is an island. We are not independent. We are interdependent. This mindset in America, just independent, rugged frontierism, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, that may work philosophically in the earth. It doesn't work in the church. I don't pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I lift you up by yours. And you lift me up by mine. Look around this room. And you will see in this room the people on whom you depend to get to heaven. And you will see people who depend on you to get there as well. And that is the point I want to arrive at tonight. We are accountable for one another. There is an incredible responsibility that rests on the shoulders of that man and his good wife. And it is not to be compared to anything I know of and cannot be explained until you have experienced it for yourself. Because until you know that you're going to stand before God one day and give an account for how you handled the church that he died for, that'll keep you up at night. That's why you better be double careful before you put your tongue against the man of God for a decision he made that you don't understand. You better be careful. You better be careful. He's trying to get you to heaven. I want to tell you, as I've traveled this year, every pastor I've talked with, I get to my heart just breaks as they look at me and say, Brother Graham, I'm not sure what to do. If I have church, then I have no compassion. If I don't have church, I have no faith. Doesn't matter what I do. Somebody thinking they can do it better. I don't know what to do. I've never been through a pandemic before. I'm just trying to follow God and love my church. I charge you in the Holy Ghost, folks. I don't know what's going to unfold in the coming weeks, but however he leads you, would you put your criticism down and just get behind the man of God and say he's doing the best he knows how. And I trust my pastor. But I want to broaden the focus tonight for just a minute. Because he, what's your name, son? You. Ben? Peyton? I'm deaf. I'm old. I've got socks older than you. You just have to work with me. Peyton, you're from here, right? Peyton, he is not the only one here who has a responsibility to get you to heaven. You want to know who else has you know who's responsible to get Peyton to heaven? Oh, the youth pastor. No. His Sunday school teacher. Well, I mean, sure, they all have a part. You know who's responsible to get Peyton to heaven? You are. And you are. And you are. And you are. And you are. No, you're not his pastor and don't you ever try to be. But how you live affects how that boy lives. How you worship affects how he worships. How faithful you are affects how faithful he... Folks, we're in this thing together, and I bear a responsibility to help get that man to heaven. 
Watch, okay, let me, let me show you something. You be seated a minute. Several years ago, my wife and I were vacationing. It was Christmas time, and we, I had a bunch of, it was my last year leaving the youth division. I had a bazillion frequent flyer miles. My family was all scattered everywhere for the holidays, and so we just like, where have we never been that we'd like to go? And we decided we had never been to the Bay Area in, in California. So we, and it's a neat place to visit. I wouldn't live there, but it's a neat place to visit. <laughs> Couldn't afford to live there, Father. It's nuts. But, but it's cool. Went to Alcatraz and Garadelli Square and Fisherman's Wharf and all that stuff that's there. You know, went out and saw the, 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 the uh, Jelly Belly Factory. I mean, it's pretty cool. Make the gumdrops, you know, or whatever those je jelly, what, isn't that what they're called? Jelly Belly gumdrop things? I don't know, whatever. It was cool. But we went one day up over the Golden Gate Bridge through South Salido up in a place called Muir Woods. Muir Woods is one of the groves of redwoods in California. Now, if you've never been to see the redwoods, no picture does them justice. No National Geographic video on YouTube does them justice. They tower 300 feet tall. Staggering. I mean, you just have to see them to fully appreciate it. It's just, it's just incredible. So we drive up there. Now, I'm a Midwesterner. I grew up in southern Illinois. I know a little bit about this part of the country. And, and I'm aware of a little factoid because my brain is cluttered with such. That the average tree here in this part of the country, oaks, maples, elms, all that kind of stuff, the average tree, however tall it is, that's how deep the roots go. If you got a 20-foot maple, on average, the soil can affect it, but on average, the roots will go down 20 feet. you got an old mature 60-foot oak, the roots probably go down about 60 feet. There is, on average, as much wood beneath the ground as there is above the ground. So I'm standing there in that forest, Looking at 300 foot trees. Wow. We're walking through the, down this little path, and there's a sign out there that's put up by the Forestry Service. And it says, and I quote, the roots of the average redwood go down three feet. No. Fake news. Ain't no way. I just look dumb. I've had, I've had physics. I've studied kinematics, Newtonian physics in college. Did that sound impressive? <laughs> you give me a 300-foot lever, and the fulcrum is there at the point in the ground. Those coastal breezes hitting that with a 300-foot-long lever, ain't no three-foot roots holding that up. I thought, that's a typo. That should have said 300. Decimal error. Sister Bounds, I wish I could tell you what happened next. I'm making this up. But before God, this is what my wife lives with. I went to go find a park ranger. <laughs> to tell them they had a typo on their sign. I walked down there and I saw one of the rangers down there feeding Yogi and Boo Boo or whatever it was he was doing. And I... <laughs> I ran out to him. I said, hey, sir, I hate to be the one to bring this to you. I'm surprised nobody's mentioned it. A little, it's going to be embarrassing for you, I know. But I said, up there around that corner and down that path, there's a sign down there. I know it's embarrassing. couldn't be true. It says that the roots of these trees, these people, it says it's, I'm embarrassed to even mention Your sign says the roots only go down three feet. He said, that's true. No. Look for a different park ranger. <laughs> I said, sir, that's not possible. There is no way these trees could stand up. And he said, did you read the rest of the sign? <laughs> there was more. <laughs> come here, guys. Come here. I got two helpers. Come on. Come, come. Quick, 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 quick. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Stand on either side of me here. He said, the roots of the average redwood only go down three feet, but they go out up to a mile. And in that mile, they find the roots of the next redwood. And they tie them. And they find the roots of the next redwood. And they tie them together. He said the wind isn't blowing on any one tree. It's blowing on the whole forest. And he said since the wind can't knock down the forest, it can't knock down any one member as long as they hold on to each other. Hell can take its best shot, but hell can't knock down the church.
church. So if we just hold on to each other, we're going to make it. I looked at that park ranger and doesn't understand anything, and I said, I hope you know I'm going to preach the hair off that. He said, well, here's a little more hair. He said, there have been trees out in that forest that we thought they were dead. They hadn't shown a sign of life for years, but their neighbors just wouldn't let go of them. And he said, sure enough, one spring, we walked out and there's a little leaf on the end of a limb. And if you saw them today, you'd never know they were sick. You'd never know they were weak. You'd never know they were struggled because their neighbors just held on to them. Come on, somebody, when I'm weak, hold on to me. When you're weak, I'll hold on to you because life is going to come back. Strength is going to come back. We're in this thing together. So I can do nothing that would hinder that young man on his journey to heaven, even if that means depriving myself of my rights. And I must do everything to help him get to heaven, even if that means sacrificing beyond what some would call comfortable or reasonable. You'd be seated. You know what? It would be good if I'd get to my text. Even people who know hardly anything about the Bible have at least heard of the Ten Commandments. If nothing else, they are aware of the legal battles which have surrounded their display in public venues around our country. This concise expression of God's moral code is known as the Decalogue. And I've known all my life from Sunday school on that if you want to read a list of the Ten Commandments, they're found in two places in Scripture. Sunday school taught me that. Youth group taught me that. Bible school taught me that. And God made it easy for us because they're found in two places. Exodus 20, that's 10 times 2. And Deuteronomy 5, it's 10 divided by 2. Use your phone if you need help. <laughs> that's where you find the Ten Commandments. 10 times 2 in Exodus, 10 divided by 2 in Deuteronomy. You read them when God first gave them to Moses, and then you read them in Deuteronomy when Moses recites them again in the nation before his departure. And all my life I've known, Pastor, that that's where you find them, two places, two, two lists. Oh, I, I mean, I know there's other verses certainly through the Bible that reiterate those truths, but if you want to find a list of them, two places, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, and I always believed that until recently. I was reading in Leviticus chapter 19. And I was amazed to discover, and I don't take your Bible and start digging right now. You can do it on your own later. I was amazed to discover. <laughs> I just had one old boy back there about blew his transmission out, tried to put it in reverse all of a sudden. He's, he's grabbing his Bible and just put it back down. I was amazed to discover that in Leviticus 19, there is a third listing of the commandments. Oh, they're not quite as concise. They're not in the same order. Some of them are worded just a little differently, but it just blew my mind when I realized, and I'm going to take on a whirlwind journey. They're not going to put it on the screen. This is your homework assignment for later. But commandment number one from Exodus is, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Egypt. Thou said, I have no other gods before me. Here's Leviticus 19, 36 and 37. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe my statutes and all my judgments and do them. I am the Lord. Commandment number two is no graven images. Here's Leviticus, all in 19, Leviticus 19 and 4. Turn you not unto idols, nor make yourself molten gods. Commandment number three, don't take his name in vain. Here's Leviticus 19 and 12. Ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shall thou profane the name of thy God. Commandment number four is about the Sabbath. Leviticus 19 and 3, keep my Sabbaths. Man, it got about there, and I went, hey. So I grab a piece of paper, and I've got Exodus 20. I print out Exodus 20 on one page, and I print out Leviticus 19 on the next, and I tape them together, and I start drawing lines. Here's commandment one. There's two. There's three. Commandment number five is about honor your father and mother. Here's Leviticus 19 and three. Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father. I might point out to you, Exodus says honor. It mentions dad first. It says fear. It mentions mom first. 
Hi, Mom. <laughs> That's good preaching right there. Commandment number six, don't kill. Here's Leviticus 19 and 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Remember when Jesus said, ye've heard, but I say, if you hate him, you've committed murder. He didn't make that up on the spot. He reached back into Leviticus 19 and quoted from there. Commandment number seven is no adultery. Leviticus 19, 20, and 29 talks about lying carnally with a woman, prostitutes, and whoredoms. Commandment number eight says don't steal. Leviticus 19, 11, ye shall not steal. Commandment number nine, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Here's Leviticus 19, 11, 13, 16. Neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Thou shalt not stand against the blood of thy neighbor. So I'm amazed. So I've got, there's one, two, there's three down here, there's four, there's five, six, okay, there's seven, there's eight, there's nine. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And as amazed as I was to find those nine listed, I was even more confused when I couldn't find number 10. Number 10 is the one I read you about, don't covet, don't covet what your neighbor has, don't covet his house, his, any of that stuff. I looked all through Leviticus 19 and I couldn't find anything that looked like it was dealing with coveting. On first glance and second, third, I, I couldn't find anything that seemed to, and I thought, now wait a minute. God, you're ruining a really good sermon about right now. <laughs> I mean, was it somehow less important? Was it not a challenge that God didn't feel like it needed to be listed again? I, and then I thought, oh, wait a minute, I got it, I got it. There were no chapters back then. It's probably the end of 18 or the first of 20. That was brilliant. It was wrong, but it was brilliant. <laughs> I used my high dollar Bible software program and searched the whole book of Leviticus. You know how many times the word covet is in the book of Leviticus? Zero. And then... Pastor, I found it. Number 10 is in the corner. Look with me if you would, and they've got this scripture for you. Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Watch, thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Well, okay, wait, I don't expect you to understand just yet. Give me a minute. You see, coveting is when you want something that is not yours. When you look at something that belongs to somebody else and say, I want that for myself. And God made it clear to Israel that the corners of their field were not theirs. They belonged to somebody who was weak and in need. And don't panic and let your billfold seize up. I'm not talking about your money right now. You might have planted it. You might have watered it. You might have cut the weeds down out of it, but it's not yours. It belongs to somebody who doesn't have enough to get by. It belongs to somebody who's weak and weary, somebody who's tired. What's in the corner belongs to them. And if you look at it and say, I want that, you are coveting what belongs to them. I'll get there. Hold on. Don't panic. I'm okay. This is what Ruth capitalized on. She came back from Moab and went into the field of Boaz and went around gathering. Now, I know, I know. He told him to throw down handfuls on purpose. That's because she was good looking. And that was Boaz being generous. But listen to me. Boaz does not get a pat on the back for letting Ruth come and glean in his field. Listen, Ruth was not picking up Boaz's grain. Ruth was picking up Ruth's grain. Because God had already said to Boaz, what's in the corner of your field? That don't belong to you. 
That's Ruth. That's the widow. That's the broken. That's the hurting. And Boaz, if you try to take it, you will be violating the 10th commandment because you will be coveting what is not yours. Boaz didn't do anything magnanimous by letting her in there. He don't get a pat on the back. He'd have got thumped in the head if he hadn't. Okay, so here we go. It might have been his soil, but it wasn't his corner. He might have done the work, but it wasn't his produce. God had already given it to somebody else. And if he tries to keep it, he is coveting what is not his. The grain existed for the good of someone in need. The grain existed so that someone who was weak and someone that was broken and someone that was hurting could come into another's field and find something that God had given to them to give them enough strength to make it through the week. I kind of think that's how the church works. No, I'm not talking about your finances. Quit looking at me that way. I'll go this way. Not everything in your worship field belongs to you. Think about it. Not everything in your praise field belongs to you. Some of your praise is to give strength to him. And some of your worship is so she'll be strong. And some of your faithfulness is for his benefit. And some of your sacrifice is for her. Because God said when we come together, there'll be somebody weak and they're broken and they're battered. But God says you've got what belongs to them. You've got a little extra praise. You've got a little extra worship. It's not yours. It's theirs. I don't just praise and worship so I feel good. Okay, let me say it in English like this. Preach with me just a minute. I'm not supposed to praise God until I feel him. I'm supposed to praise God until you do. I'm not supposed to sing until I have victory. I'm supposed to sing until you have victory. I'm not supposed to worship till I'm strong. I'm supposed to worship until you're strong. Come on, church, part of my faithfulness is yours. Part of my sacrifice is yours. Part of my field belongs to you. And if I don't give that extra, somebody might die. But if I look and I give a couple little hallelujahs till I feel one little spiritual doodad, and then I say, okay, that's enough, I'm fine. What about the person who's battled hell all week and staggered into this place needing to be able to eat out of your sacrifice? I preach to you, we have to enter the church with a mindset. I'm not just giving enough, I'm giving a little extra. Hey. I got some worship in the corner of my field. It don't belong to me. It belongs to that man. I've got a little celebration in the corner of my field. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to that lady back there that hell's been beaten up all week. And I'm going to give a little extra so she can find what she needs in the church. Because if I look at that extra and say, I think I'll keep that, I'm coveting. The strength that belongs to her. You be seated with me, man. I'll make this practical for just a moment. About five or six years ago, probably, Pastor, went through one of the darkest seasons of my life. I was broken and crushed. I didn't feel God. I was pastoring. You say, oh, you were the pastor. Yeah, that's probably why. I was hurting had some betrayals and harsh things said. And, and Pastor, I, I didn't feel God for weeks. I felt so dry. I'm sitting there in church on Sunday morning. I sat just about in our church about where you do here. And I'm trying. I'm looking around my field and there's not a blade of grass anywhere. Just dust. There's nothing there. I tried hallelujah. I couldn't feel anything. I got to get up and preach in a few minutes, and I got nothing. I don't feel anything. I don't want to preach. I just, I'm so broken and empty and dry. 
I'm just fumbling around in my field looking for one little whiff of a blade of grass someplace. And I got nothing. Choir's up there singing. I'm dying on the front row. And back over here, one of our founding members of our church, little Granny Foster. Everybody in church calls her Granny. Most folks don't even know her name. She just granny. If she introduced herself to you, she'd say, hi, I'm granny. Little granny Foster. I don't mean to be unkind, but um, she's old. She makes my mom look young. I'm not sure how old she is. She's sneezing dust. Combing cobwebs. I mean, it's, you know. And she got up. And she started for the front. And all I'm thinking is, you better hurry. I don't know how long that song is. <laughs> Be a little embarrassing, wouldn't it, to get about there and they quit? You just... <laughs> but she made it. They probably saw her coming. She got up there. Got up in the front, that dear little, frail little, white-headed lady. She put those little bony hands up, them big blue veins sticking out of them. And she gave it everything she had, Pastor. I ran out of my chair as fast as this pudgy little self could get over there. I ran over and grabbed that little bony hand. And when I did, the Holy Ghost shot through me. I felt more of God than I had felt in the last several weeks. You want to know why? Because she gave a little extra. And I came stumbling in weakness into the corner of her field. And I picked up some grain. She didn't give that to be saved. She gave that so I would be saved. Come on, church, I'm calling for you to go the second mile. Don't just give enough to feel good about yourself. Go a little further because somebody is depending on the corner of your field. I honestly don't know what would have happened to me if Sister Foster hadn't given the corner that day. I hope I would have made it, but I was drunk. I was empty. I was broken and weary, ready to quit. And with my last little bit of strength, I stumbled over into the corner of her worship field. And I found what I needed to make it another day. I thank God that precious dear elder gave what she didn't have to give, but she gave what I needed. She didn't know it was for me. She just gave it to God and said, let anybody that's hungry come over here and find something to eat. I wonder who there is tonight that's broken and empty and is just waiting on somebody to give a little extra. Because the simple fact is that there is a corner of my field that belongs to you. And there's something that I can give to God that was not mine in the first place. A part of my commitment to Christ is to provide some strength to a weary man down the pew from me. And I violate the 10th commandment when I look at that extra and consider it mine. Because a portion of my worship belongs to you. And a portion of my faithfulness belongs to you. When I pray, it's not all about me. When I give, it's not all about me being blessed. When I separate myself to holy living, it is in part for your spiritual well-being. When I discipline myself in conduct and appearance, I may just be saving a teenager who is watching me. When I worship when I don't feel like it, I might be strengthening a soul who's been battered by the enemy all week long. When I come to service after a long, weary week of work, when I'd really just like to relax at home, I just might make the difference for someone, a discouraged member of the family, 
might need to walk through the corner of my commitment field to make it another day. And when, and when I feel like it's too much for God to ask me to give more of my time or my energy or my emotions or my money or my worship or my prayer, I need to shake myself and remember it wasn't all mine in the first place. The corners that he asked me to give belong to you. You can be seated just a minute. I'm going to finish right here. You, you can come. I'm, somebody can come. I'm, I'm done. My uh, grandparents, my mom. If, hi, mom. My mom's maiden name was Klepper. K-L-O-E-P-P-E-R. That's not Irish. That's German. My grandparents came over when they were, I, they were just young. I mean, infants, toddlers over on the boat from Germany. German is their native language. And uh, my grandmother would occasionally flip back over into German. She'd get together with her sister. She'd... German's a good mad language. It's hard to be romantic in German, you know. I mean, French is you know. German sounds like you have hay fever. <laughs> My grandmother would jump over to German sometimes. She'd get aggravated or excited. They were married in 1919. They lived in a little town over in Illinois across the river from St. Louis ways. Early in their marriage, they'd just been married a year or two. My grandmother got a very severe ear infection. Now today, antibiotics, no big deal. Back then, didn't have that choice. The danger, the proximity to the brain, you know, of that infection, it could be very, very serious. It lingered for weeks. There was, in the early 1920s, a large revival that took place near Belleville, Illinois, called the Cook Revival. And uh, now my grandparents came over from the old country, Germany. They were Lutheran, with a capital Luth. They didn't even really believe in all that stuff. So but they, they, one night, the Cook Revival, they advertised a healing night. My grandparents didn't even really necessarily believe in all that. But they were desperate. So they went. Sat in the back row. A little put off by what went on. I'd love to tell you the middle of service, the lightning struck, my grandma was healed, and they started talking in tongues. That didn't happen. They sat in the back. And uh, they were too respectful to leave, but they didn't plan on being back. They watched the, the whole production and everything. Service got done. And the man leading the service that night saw a gentleman that was pastoring in the Belleville area, old brother Underwood. The Underwood name is iconic in Pentecost in Illinois. He saw brother Underwood there and he invited brother Underwood up to pray the dismissal prayer. Now, I've grown up in this all my life. I cannot tell you I remember one night ever that I was profoundly impacted by a dismissal prayer. If that has been a spiritual mountaintop for you, I'm excited for you, but I don't understand you. The Lord takes us to our separate place of abode, brings us back to the appointed time, bless the Wendy's in Jesus' name. Everybody's getting their keys out, you know. Old Brother Underwood stepped up to that pulpit. And instead of just pushing play on the pre-recorded prayer, he reached over into the corner of the field. And, and, and Brother Bounds, I don't know where praying stopped and preaching started or where preaching stopped and prophesying started. All I know is halfway through that prayer, my grandfather leaned over to my grandmother and said, I don't know who that is, but we're going to his church. And that's how Pentecost came into my family. I baptized my children in Jesus' name because of a dismissal prayer in the corner of a field. Because one man said, I'm not just going to give what I have to give. I'm going to offer a little something extra. And now here my wife and I are, 
I'm third generation Pentecost on both sides of my family. My wife is sixth. But the only reason was because somebody said, I'm not doing just enough to get by. Old Brother Underwood didn't say, I'll just pray long enough to make sure I go to heaven. I hope you won't think, I pray my spirit is pure. I don't want this to sound boastful or vain. He didn't have any idea in that dismissal prayer that he was given the United Pentecostal Church a general secretary. He didn't have a clue that on the last day of January 2021, that he'd be providing the guest speaker for the Anchor Church in Zanesville, Ohio. He just knew, I'm not just going to give what I have to give. Give a little something extra. And all I'm saying is you never know what might happen you don't know what might happen next Sunday morning if you'd walk in this place with a heart that says I'm not just going to worship the amount I have to when I get done with that I'm going to reach over in the corner of my field and I'm going to give a little extra because down the pew from me might be a drug addict and I can't expect him to praise God till he feels him. I've got to praise God till he feels him. Because 20 years from now, he might be preaching someplace. I've got to be faithful so that he goes to heaven. I've got to be faithful so I help your kids go to heaven. It's not just about me. The corner of the field belongs to you. So you can stand, I'm done. Preach too long, I'm sorry. So I wonder sometimes, Pastor, if maybe we don't do it backwards. Because you know what we usually do at the close of a service? We also, okay, everybody with a need, everybody that's broken, everybody that's weak, everybody that's battered, come on up here to the front. And then we kind of hope that maybe somebody will come up and join them. I wonder if instead what we ought to do is say, okay, who's got a little extra tonight? Who's God been good to this week? And you're, you, 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 you were battered a few weeks ago, but tonight you're feeling pretty good. Who, who, who's got some extra praise that you didn't already give up when, when Pastor was up there leading us just that last little bit? Who, who still got the corner of your field that you could come up here and give? And then once that's populated... Maybe that's when we should look at the broken and say, now look, this is all for you. This isn't for them. They'll have a time they need to eat out of your field. But tonight, these are the folks that have some extra. <laughs> I don't know how this will work. I just wonder if there's anybody that's got some extra tonight. Anybody? Anybody got some extra? He just wants to come and say, hey, I, I've got some praise that you can feast on. I, I've got some celebration you can dine on. I, I've got some strength you can come and get. I, I may need yours next week, but I still got a dance tonight. I, I still got some rejoicing tonight. I, I, still, I, I want you to go to heaven. I got a hold of your roots. We're going to make it. Come on, come on, come on. If you need something, you get up here among your brothers and sisters. There's a buffet of Holy Ghost strength up here today. There's a plenteous bounty of strength and glory and grace in this place tonight. I feel the touch of the Holy Ghost ready to help you. If you're broken and you're weary, don't stand back there and look. Come on up here among us. There's the corner of a field that is here for you right now.